in the new episode of Education Exchange tonight, I would like to welcome the uh, heroes of the preschool program at Wendell Johnson, which is uh, a very important program affiliated with Lincoln and Elementary School in Iowa City. Uh, for our viewers, this is our 21st year on the air of this program. The program started many years ago with uh, John Karhoff and Mike Peterson, and we have been actually collaborating with Public Access TV ever since. They offer us the studio, the facilities, the technical support, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 21 years serving uh, Iowa City Community School District is uh, quite an endeavor and uh, uh, we would like to uh, shed the light tonight on, a, on your important program because you are serving uh, some of our most needy kids in the community here and um, first of all I would like you to introduce yourself uh, we have Beth Lauren and Lauren uh, uh, Lauren, you introduce yourself. How did you get interested in this? And then uh, w you give us a little bit background. What's Wendell Johnson? Why why do we call it Wendell Johnson? And then uh, Lauren will follow with giving us some idea about the affiliation with Lincoln Elementary. And Beth, you will talk about the curriculum and how you teach. Uh, what what does it entail? And we go from there. Uh, I'll start with uh, Lauren. Sure. I'm Lauren Zubo, and I'm a speech and language pathologist. Um, I'm actually employed by the University of Iowa, um, and I work at the Wendell Johnson Speech and Hearing Preschool. Well, the Wendell Johnson Preschool. <laughs> um, this preschool program has, um, has been there for three years now, the collaboration between the University of Iowa and the Iowa City Community School District. Um, before that, there was a preschool program in the building, but it was run by Grantwood Area Education Agency, and so this is kind of a new program for the district. And um, it used to be called kids. It used to be Kid Talk. Oh uh, yeah, Kid so Talk. So people yeah. in the community might know it as Kid Talk, and now right. we are the Iowa City Community School District Preschool at Wendell Johnson. Um, we've gone through changes in our name, so <laughs> we're all trying to figure it out. Um, Wendell Johnson. Um, the Wendell Johnson Speech and Hearing Clinic is um, the building on campus where all of the um, students who are studying communication sciences and disorders, who are studying speech and language pathology and audiology, um, attend their coursework. That's where research is done in that building. And we are lucky to have these two preschool classrooms in the building. Um, Wendell Johnson was a pioneer of speech and language pathology, and he was interested in stuttering and stuttering disorders. Um, and he was really the founding father of speech and language pathology. So we have this huge name to kind yeah, of live up to. Him. Yeah. Um, and so um, what's really neat about our program is that we um, have access to these speech and language pathology students who are um, master students who can provide this really intensive service to the kids that attend our preschool program. And so my job is to provide direct services as a speech and language pathologist and to provide supervision to the master students who are doing sort of their practicum experience in the preschool classroom. Excellent. Uh, uh, Lauren, uh, now you are a uh, preschool uh, special educator in this center, right? Yes. And uh, what does, uh, uh, well, t tell me about your uh, job uh, description. Yes, absolutely. Think. As well as, uh, give me an idea why this program is with Lincoln Elementary. Okay. Um, so I'm the classroom, one of the classroom teachers at preschool at Wendell Johnson. Um, we have a morning and an afternoon session, so we have some kids that come right away in the morning. Um, from 8.30 to 11, and then we have another group that comes from 12.15 to 3 o'clock. Our morning classroom is um, all students with disabilities, so it's not an inclusive classroom. And then our afternoon program is we have gen ed peers and we have students with disabilities, so we kind of have a nice mix between the morning and the afternoon class. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but is this disability, is it physical or uh, emotional? What kind, what, kind, what kind of disability is it? So we have students that um, come in with various types of disabilities. We have some students who are there um, purely for communication reasons, um, social, 
behavior, some kids with fine motor. So it's kind of across the board as to what kind of students we have. So. And uh, uh, your connection with Lincoln is, uh, I, I, when I talked to the principal of Lincoln early this year, she was interested in shedding the light on your program in particular. Uh, she was proud of this program and proud of her affiliation with you, right? Yes. Um, so Ann Langenfeld, the principal right. at Lincoln Elementary, has been our rock <laughs> for mm -hmm. the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, the principal at Roosevelt, I believe, was right. Yeah, Chris. was the administrator. Chris was before that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yes. And so Ann has been our our principal, and so we have a wonderful partnership with her and Lincoln. Um, she comes to meetings that we have for incoming students. Um, she comes by the preschool. She provides professional development. So she's very much a part of our program, even though we're not in the same building. Beth, uh, who are you and what are you doing? Well, my name is Beth Wise, and I am also an early childhood special ed teacher in the preschool. As Lauren said, there are two classrooms. So I'm in the other classroom. Um, again, same focus, a lot of communication, um, social skills that we focus on. Um, I've been there also for three years. Lauren and I started at the same time. Love working there. We have um, mainly three-year-olds in the morning that we work with in the afternoon. Um, mostly four-year-olds turning five. I think my class this year, all of the kids will be going on to kindergarten um, when they finish early June. We have um, a curriculum that is just like all of the other preschool programs in the Iowa City School District. We have a program called Creative Curriculum. Uh, we focus on language skills, uh, social, emotional, physical, math, literacy, to the whole gamut. Um, a lot of it is focused with center-based, where the kids are allowed to move around from center to center. Um, they have dramatic play area, a science area, sensory table, um, reading area, and it gives us the chance to move around, work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Lauren's students, um, the master students, come in to the classroom sometimes, and we'll work with them in the room, interact. It's our chance also, though, to focus on helping them with their communication, uh, and as Lauren Arno mentioned, in the afternoon we have gen ed students who are there as peer models to help help with that communication for our kids that we are working with. Uh, Lauren, is it the, the only center in Iowa City community that offers this service? Yep, so as far as our Iowa City district preschools, there are some um, community preschools, but we're kind of unique in that we're the only off-site program that has this partnership with the university. So it is a very unique program. What is the most challenging experience that you face, Lauren, during working? I think it's just challenging to have, we have some of the most severe kids in the district in our, in our preschool program. And sometimes it's just challenging because you, you want to see so much growth so quickly but it takes a while and that's why early intervention Patience. is so important because when you can address their communication needs early on in their development, um, even though we see slow growth, we have huge impact on later skills. And so it is frustrating at times to, to work so hard on just a simple sign like more or um, eat and, and to work for maybe six months and get you know, very little growth, but then all of a sudden you see that huge change in their development and they skyrocket. And then, um, so that's, a, it's, it's a challenge, but it's also exciting. During the day in, in your area, how many kids do you see or interact with? How many kids do I interact yeah. with? We have about 24 kids with IEPs. No, not the whole school, you in particular. So I interact with every single one of the kids who have an IEP every day that I'm there. Uh, isn't, that isn't that uh, too much for one mm -hmm. person to do? Actually, I consider myself really lucky because um, <laughs> uh, I'm able, because I'm there all day long, 
Um, and because I can work, sometimes we're working on social skills, so you're working in small groups. So you're working on turn taking or greeting or um, making a request to a peer, making a request to an adult. So um, it, it sounds like a lot, but it's really not. You definitely enjoy your role. Yeah. yeah. I think we all do. It's, yes, it's <laughs> one of the best jobs. It's a lot of fun. And uh, Lauren, how did you select to be in this career? Um, I've always known I wanted to be a teacher, and I um, have a very personal influence in my life. My youngest brother, not such a baby anymore, <laughs> um, has intellectual disabilities. So I've always known that I was very passionate about working with um, people with disabilities. And so as I went into teaching, that's the career path I chose. And I so wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs> uh, there is personal passion. Yes, very much involved so. Involved in the whole process. Too. Yep. And Beth, how, how did you get into this? Um, I would have to say the same. Ever since I was a little girl, I just remember growing up wanting to be a teacher, pretending to be a teacher. Um, when I was in high school, I spent a couple of summers working in, with, in programs with children with disabilities, fell in love with it, and decided that's what I wanted to do. Well, I have to say, uh, teaching in particular as, as a career, as a profession, is a very giving uh, mission. For me, it's a mission. And people who go into teaching are people who are not looking to make money and to be wealthy. They want to give something to humanity and to people and to the needy and so forth. And then you go from there into people who are even more specialized to work with the most challenging and most needy. Those are people who are giving really their time uh, to do that. How do you um, advise young people who are aspiring to join the profession to get into this? Now you are going to be viewed by hundreds of thousands of people, millions through YouTube. How do you encourage people to say, okay, let us put this as a priority? What motivates young people to go into this? I think what I would tell people, if, if they're showing at all any interest, to ask them to try to find a place where they can go and volunteer. They can, you know, hands-on, be a part of it. I have a daughter right now that's here at Iowa in elementary ed, and I think she also had that interest, but until she was actually able to work in a program, work with kids, you know, she realized this was her love. So any chance that kids can have where they can work and be hands-on in an activity, I think that makes a big difference. And I think, too, you just have to let them know you're right. Financially, it's not you know, as rewarding as other careers, but there are so many other perks to it. It's, it's rewarding in so many ways. I think, honey, what's so exciting about our program is that we have a lot of young um, speech pathology students who are able to have this experience with a lot of support in a classroom with really experienced and fantastic teachers. So they're not only learning um, clinical skills about speech and language pathology, but they're watching the teachers interact with the students and they're watching how a classroom is led and how a classroom is organized and they have gained so much learning and opportunity from just being able to be a part of the classroom and watch these two teachers kind of just interact and manage their classroom, which, um, you know, they, they don't always have that opportunity until they get out of school. So um, our students, our master's students um, are so, they, they love their practicum with us because they have, just opens their eyes to what it's like to really work in a school. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lauren, tell me uh, now, if a parent would like to enroll, what, what is the procedure? How can the parent bring their kid to your problem? So right now, online, on our Iowa City homepage, iowacityschools.org, there is a link to preschool registration, which was opened back in mm -hmm. February. February or March. So they can go online and that's the, it's kind of new this year. All of the registration has been shifted to online. So parents can go on there, enter their information, 
put their preferences for which preschool, and this is for four-year-olds, and that's part of the statewide voluntary four-year-old program, so they can go for free for the half-day programs. Um, the students that have disabilities in our classrooms, they come um, as referrals from Grantwood AEA. So they have first to be uh, referred by Grantwood. Mm -hmm. So if a family has concerns about their child's speech and language development, let's say at the age of 18 months or two, they, they really need to contact Grantwood Area Education Agency and get an evaluation done by them. And then once their school age, um, turning three, Grantwood um, decides if they're eligible for a preschool program based on their needs and would, if they deemed them eligible for our preschool program would place them in our preschool program. So there is a clinical test or something like that? There involved? are many There are many tests, but they also provide um, uh, treatment for a period of time to see what kind of treatment would best work, to see if they're a good fit for a preschool program and if they have the kinds of needs that a preschool program would, would provide for them. Uh, uh, is it uh, a mainstreaming idea or you uh, separate uh, various kinds of disabilities. Okay. So <laughs> it's, a difficult, it's a difficult question. No, that's because, okay. Yeah. So our af both of our afternoon classrooms are what we call inclusive classrooms. So we have some students who are typically developing and some students who have disabilities. So that would be kind of the inclusive setting. And then our morning classrooms are all students with IEPs. And those are usually kids that um, have pretty severe communicative and social needs. And so they are provided with a little bit smaller of a classroom setting, and we get a lot of new three-year-olds who come um, at that point. And when they come to us at age three, we really want to target a lot of those skills so that at age four, they can be. Our ultimate goal is always, we hate to see kids go, but we always want them to go to a, um, their least restrictive environment. So we want them to be with their gen ed peers. I realize that a lot of people, a lot of viewers now in the audience are familiar with uh, the term IEP, mm -hmm. but I would like you to tell me something about it for the people who are just starting in this community and uh, would like to know what's an IEP. Mm -hmm. So IEP stands for Individualized Educational Plan. Um, and again, as Lauren had mentioned, they will have evaluations, they'll be tested, um, and we meet as a team to determine what the child's needs are and how we can help them. Um, as a classroom teacher, I have a goal that I work on um, with them. We try to set it for about a year out and try to have them reach that goal by you know, just various activities that we do within the classroom. We monitor the goal, um, keep track of the progress, meet with the parents um, at least twice a year and make sure that they get the reports at least three times a year. And then Lauren, and the speech students also have a goal that they work on with the, with the kids also. Um, it's, it's a wonderful way to kind of stay organized and just focus on what those needs are and be able to just move on. And as Lauren Arnaud said, try to exit them if we can, if they've achieved those goals and we feel there is nothing else that um, we do need to work on with them, then we try to help them move on, as she said, to the least restrictive environment. Uh, Lauren, I would like you, uh, you're the uh, clinician here, or you're the pathologist, right? And I would like you to uh, look at the camera and talk to our audience here uh, about how can a parent feel that their child need your, needs your service? Uh, what are the signs, that early signs, that the parent can see or detect as an evidence or as a reason for them to enroll in your program? Sure. So the most important milestones that we look at for a, ch for a developing child are that they start producing words at 12 months of age. Um, and by about 15 months, they should have about 15 words. They should start putting two words together by the age of two. And um, at three years old, we really want to see kids starting to put together three words at a time. We want them to be about 75% intelligible to an unfamiliar listener. So when you go to the grocery store and they're talking to the store clerk, can they understand them about 75% of the time? 
Um, you also want to note if your child is interacting with their peers. Are they approaching their peers? Do they seem interested in playing? Are they playing with toys in an appropriate way? Um, eye contact is very important, so do you feel like your child is making appropriate eye contact with you and, and peers? Um, you know, speech and language has many different facets and um, we look at both of those things when we look at a child who may or may not have a speech and language impairment, but um, you know, how can you understand them and what are they able to understand you saying and um, what, what are they able to put together? What kinds of words are they able to put together? Um, and if you have concerns about your child's speech and language development, really the first, the first step is to call Grantwood and um, Grantwood Area Education Agency and get the evaluation done so that the, um, the process can get started because um, the process is timely. I mean, we want to make sure that we're identifying kids that actually need speech and language. Um, and so um, they, they do a fantastic job and they take their time and make sure that they're providing the right resources to families so that, you know, if families can, can make those kind of, that kind of progress, um, then that's how it's done first and foremost. And the, uh, do you do your evaluation uh, sequently? Uh, how do you do your evaluation of your progress? Here? So there. You you talked to me earlier about being patient. Yeah. And wait <laughs> and don't rush. Uh, uh, how do you do your evaluation then? So um, we. We consider lots of different resources when we do evaluations. There are many standardized tests you can use, but also, importantly, a parent report. So, you know, we look at um, observations of the child in multiple different environments, at the home, in the community, um, when they first come to preschool. Um, and then we, we have measurements that we can take regarding, you know, intelligibility. How, how much does somebody understand this child when they speak? Um, and then part of the IEP process is to really measure their progress over time. So when we start intervening and providing the therapy, then we can look at specific measurements and data that we actually collect on a very regular basis to assess whether or not what we're doing is actually working. Um, fantastically, um, our kids make really good progress, but we're able to provide them with a really intensive speech and language service and preschool program where they're getting daily reminders about using their communication and what sounds they're supposed to be working on. And so our kids make very, very good progress, as do other kids in the district as well. But you know, we're able to really see that kind of progress because we're collecting data on a really regular basis. So it's a constant evaluative process that we go through to make sure that what we're doing is working. I think probably one of the most challenging uh, job for the two of you is to convince the parent that this matter takes time and they have to endure some kind of, uh, I know that some parents may be more excited about the program, would like to see results coming in a, w in a week or so. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, face this? And now uh, you have a couple of minutes to talk to the parents, both of you, about how to uh, accept the fact that we need time and uh, we need uh, space to uh, deal with the problem and find a solution for it. Um, for the most part, I think we have parents that are very, um, very understanding of what their student's disability might be, and they, they understand that it's going to take time. They're not, we're not going to see results overnight, which would, it would be great if we did. Um, I think a big thing, too, is the IEP does not show everything that they're doing. And so we might just be targeting using signs and you know, sitting at a table and attending to tasks. But those two things don't show all of their development and all of the progress they're making. So I think our um, anecdotal notes, so just notes of what they're doing in the classroom, kind of contribute to that as well. Beth, uh, you have a final word now. Well, um, along with having our IEP meetings that we have with the family, we have a review uh, once a year. But as I mentioned, we meet with them at least two or three times during the school year. We um, also have parent-teacher conferences, just like they would at the um, public schools. Um, and it's our chance to share with them, like Lauren said, beyond just what 
um, the IEP is covering. We are able to go over what we're working on academically and social skills, any of those areas. And as Lauren mentioned, the parents are very understanding, very excited to have their child in our program. Um, and I, they completely trust us. They know that this is where their child is meant to be. And it's, it's just been a good fit. What's the most in intriguing thing for me as an interviewer today is the fact that you are really so much passionate about what you're doing. And I can see this and the twinkle in your eyes and <laughs> the enthusiasm and the, uh, the little tears sometimes when you talk about kids with problems. And, and, and this is, uh, you, you are people with hearts and uh, definitely you are uh, given by nature uh, the right citizens in the right place to serve the right uh, uh, students too. And uh, uh, I cannot tell you how proud we are of your program and we thank uh, Lincoln for being the host of your mm -hmm. program. And uh, this program will, people will see you on channel 18, channel 21, channel 118.6 uh, and 0 .7 uh, on the high definition, as well as public access TV website, public access TV uh, uh, videos, as well as uh, YouTube. And I think uh, John Karoff, uh, we are going to be on YouTube in 24 hours, maybe 40, yeah, about 48 hours. So thank you again. Thank you. And thank good you. luck. Thank you very and much. And we'll say to our audience, have a wonderful good night.